and welcome to BFAB's series on pedagogy. In this video, our second video, we're going to focus on specific examples of ways that you can teach in the makerspace from how other folks have done it. I'm Margot Vigent, and now I'm coming to you from the Makery, Bucknell's makerspace that focuses on electronics and embedded computing in addition to all of our favorite maker technologies. Let's jump in. So this time, let's talk about teaching with the makerspace. There are three general approaches we might follow when we are bringing a maker project into a class. The first one is pretty straightforward. It's build an existing project. So we're not asking students to invent something from scratch, although we may give them the option to customize slightly. This is a really good option when our main goal, our main educational objective, is for the students to become familiar with particular technologies and just straight up try them out, use them, get their hands on for the first time. The picture I'm showing here is from our BFAB in person, where everyone starts the workshop by building their own Bluetooth speaker. And you can see this uses elements that are 3D printed, elements that are soldered, it contains an Arduino, uh, it has uh, laser cut elements, so everyone has an opportunity to practice these things in the context of doing this project. But they didn't have to invent speakers from scratch. Another option is to give the students a goal, a list of things they must incorporate, and then set them free to work within a space. A colleague of mine, Alif Miskiolu, in chemical engineering, has used this approach in her genetic engineering class. One of the projects within this course is the students must create a board game in which they have um, the people who play the game play uh, cooperatively to achieve a goal that along the way must use elements from the genetic engineering course. So that is, when you successfully play this cooperative game, you as a player will have learned some important things about genetic engineering. And the students obviously must have mastered the material ahead of time to, in order to embed it in the game. So you can see here that there are a set of elements that everybody's got to use. There's a board layout, or a number of squares anyway, and a number of interactive elements that are prescribed, as is the overall goal. But within that space, students have a lot of room for customization. They decide what topic their game is about, they embed all of the information, they do art and graphics to a greater or lesser extent, they can even make custom board game pieces. So that is an example of an instructor set goal-directed project. Finally, and most open-endedly, we have what I'd call opportunity recognition. That is, we give students a problem space and say, find something cool here and make it. Uh, this is a senior design team and their client from a project uh, that I oversaw a few years ago where the students were allowed free access to a waste stream from an apple processing plant. And their goal was, can we make a value-added product from what is otherwise a waste stream? So you see it is very open-ended. They do have physical prototyping along the way and making, but we don't know where they are going. They are seeking opportunities. When you consider what you would put into a class as you look between approach one and reproach three, recognize that there's, uh, there are benefits and costs to each of these approaches. As you move along this continuum, you are required to have greater flexibility and give more feedback, and you need to be more comfortable with a greater range of possible outcomes. As we go to uh, approach three, you're not even really sure what's going to happen. Um, it is very empowering for the students. It encourages their curiosity and connection building using past coursework. Um, it allows them to practice opportunity recognition and value creation, and they do more knowledge construction. 
However, you need a lot of time and a lot of support and a lot of feedback from you. If your course objectives are more along the lines of, folks, learn how to use this tool successfully, you are uh, much more comfortable probably with something along the lines of approach one. Um, if this is the first time you're embedding makers, makers technologies in class, you might prefer approach two. And if you are teaching capstone design, have students with a certain level of sophistication or know the technologies and uh, the problem space really well yourself, you may be ready to jump on over to approach three. There is no one right way to do things. So now I'm gonna give you a number of specific examples where um, colleagues have used the makerspace in furthering their course objectives. These are short versions of uh, these examples. You may wish to adopt some of these for your own class, and uh, if so, we have more detail on all of them. Uh, most of them are captured as what is called cards on the engineeringunleashed.com website, and links are provided in the video. Um, but one of them is a ASEE conference paper, also with a link provided in the video. Let's dive in. So if you want to see the paper here, just hit pause and use your phone on that QR code and it'll take you to the paper. So first up is an example from biomedical engineering, although this is applicable, as are almost all of these examples, across a range of disciplines. This is for a sophomore level class where uh, one of the outcomes is that the students gain an appreciation of the different types of fabrication technologies that are available to them. Why one would use them, what their limitations are, and uh, an appreciation also of things like the importance of technical documentation and tolerances and um, uh, uh, drawings. So in this course, student teams build, first draw and then build, two sides of a six-sided die. And each other team is building two sides of a six-sided die. So the perfect project comes together and it all fits the parts that were made by the same team along with the parts made by the other teams with whom they had to communicate. This project really emphasizes uh, communication along with using CAD and discovering repeatedly sometimes the capabilities of the makerspace tools. Another problem along these lines is found in a first year course for mechanical engineering students taught by my colleague Nate Siegel. This project spans the entire course, although it really comes into play most strongly towards the end of the class. Nate provides student teams with the uh, motor for a toy car and asks them to design in CAD, which is the goal of the course, a chassis and drive system that will have a snap fit with the motor. This, again, gives students a particularly good understanding of the difference between making a nice drawing and making an accurate prototype. They learn about shrinkage, they learn about how not every 3D printer or laser cutter has the exact same tolerances, kerf, um, shrinkage, and so on. So they use laser cutting, 3D printing, and hand tools in putting these together. And they have a celebration on the last day of class where all the cars that can go do in a little race. This example, is from uh, a colleague, Greg Pask, who is uh, animal behavior, and Matt Lamparder from our electrical and computer engineering department. This was something designed for research. So we want to uh, emphasize here, a makerspace is great for using in class, and in fact, you could use this device in class, but it can also provide tools that aid with research, citizen science, and scholarship, uh, and student projects. So keep in mind, 
We are not just limited to classes here, even though we speak most directly about courses. It is quite expensive to buy a tracking, a video tracking system that follows your experimental ants or other small creatures around. This is a approximately hundred dollar version that is just as good for most purposes as what you can buy based on a Raspberry Pi and laser cut and 3D printed parts. This is something that you could produce, for example, so that every student lab bench in an animal behavior lab had access to it, or it's something that you could ask your research students to uh, make and build upon, or even it's something that you could embed and ask students to improve upon if you were teaching a lab where this sort of tracking uh, was necessary. Lots of possibilities with the Pi Spy. Back again to first year courses, um, we find a lot of good hands-on projects that pull together integrative aspects of a discipline, whether we're talking about looking forward uh, into the rest of the curriculum from first or second year, or looking back across the curriculum from senior design. This Internet of Things environmental sensing machine uh, from Stu Thompson is uh, thought of best in two parts, both of which are relevant for making. The first part is actually design and build an environmental sensor system uh, that uses an Arduino, although you could substitute in any similar uh, controlling device. So this uh, is a project for introduction to electrical and computer engineering. So that first part leans rather heavily on electrical engineering. You can see they have to set up the circuits and uh, they have to make it actually work. And they could use any of a variety of environmental sensors. Uh, they, don't, they aren't constrained to one particular type. Um, depending on what it is they want to do. The second part is programming and data analysis. Now that they have a way to measure a thing, we want them to measure that thing and create the analysis such that something happens based on that measurement. What can we now do now that we know more? And that's what's uh, the marvel of this project. And this project spans an entire semester as well. Last but not least, uh, our colleague Deborah Sills from Civil and Environmental Engineering has a project with low-cost air pollution sensors. And this could be something that takes several weeks out of a course, but as currently constructed, it just takes one or two lab periods. Again, as with the Pi Spy, there are very expensive environmental pollution sensors that one could buy, but that is a bit prohibitive for things like citizen science or a wide uh, deployment of pollution sensors around an area. However, as the cost drops and we have things that are kind of homemade, perhaps the, uh, the accuracy or the precision of our measurements isn't quite as good. So in this project, student TAs have pre-made several low cost sensors uh, you can see an image of one here, and the lab itself has students test and calibrate these and decide which of them is good enough to actually use in a wide-ranging deployment in measuring environmental pollution in and around uh, our local area. So we have some really nice decision-making, measurement and testing emphasized here, and one could add to it additional making, that is, after students have assessed and made a decision, they can build out five or six of these sensors and then deploy them and analyze those data. Or you could stop right there with the students making a recommendation on uh, which sensor is better. And so, I've taken you on a whirlwind tour through uh, examples across technical disciplines of ways where people have used the makerspace in their class for either small things or big things that take the entire course. There's lots of ways to work this in, and uh, I hope you see that each of those examples is applicable 
uh, with modification across a variety of disciplines. You are not locked into being an ECE if you're doing environmental sensors. There are other resources to find inspiration for projects you might do. Um, as I mentioned already, these are cards on Engineering Unleashed, most of them, or ASEE papers. This is a great source to scroll through, both of which may, uh, ASEE papers do not require a membership after uh, a year after the uh, presentations have been given. Engineering Unleashed requires a free membership and that's how uh, uh, these resources are kind of hidden from students, but available to faculty. I have a number of other websites here that have some really great making applications that you could take for your class. And remember, these are given as examples. You may use them as a design build uh, project in the category one version, or you may take them as inspiration as a jumping off point for something much uh, more open-ended that you ask your own students to do. We want to get you inspired. Next up, our final video on pedagogy takes you through designing your own project for class.